And I was wondering, though, uh, if you could say something about this in relation to like the three different types, the three different environments the archaeology could be in, which is like on the continent shelf, on land, and in space. Do you think that the change that they experience would be compensated for by some other relief from change? Or you mean the, the, the fact that you might feel that you are an ant because you're put in, a, in a, some kind of structure which has elements in common with the, with the ant hill? Uh, no, what I mean actually is uh, the amount of change in your social activities, the change in uh, the communication with people that are involved in living in our college, mm -hmm. would that be... Uh, would that amount of change be compensated for in some other way by relief from the changes yeah. that we're subjected to now, the elements of changes we're subjected to now? Well, I think we should try to qualify change in, uh, in the negative aspects and the positive aspect. And I think the negative aspect is just change uh, for the sake of, of, uh, of getting away from something. The positive aspect is change because you're growing into something. You know, you, you really develop yourself into something better by changing. And I think the two uh, are at, at the op opposite end of, of the change, uh, let's say, uh, parameter. I don't, know if, uh, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Uh, what I'm talking about is uh, like any type of change at all, an unqualified change. Yeah. Um, this theory was put forward in Future Shock mm -hmm. uh, with Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that any type of change at all causes an effect. Yeah. And like a certain amount of change it is acceptable. Like they found, they experimented with those sailors who had been sent out to sea for long periods of time. And they had questionnaires how much change were they subjected to mm -hmm. in certain categories. And they found out the ones who were subjected to the most change in the year prior to the time they went out to the sea. Uh, they had the most illness. Yeah, I remember. I remember that. Yeah. Well, in in many in many ways, what I'm suggesting is not that radical. You know, you're you're still very much able to go to go on in your activities in the same way, identical way. I would say that the main change is that it's like if somebody would would pull around you things that now are far away from you. So much so much close to you that you, you can just reach for them. But if you don't want, you ignore them because uh, you have a separation, uh, you have a diaphragm that separates you from those things. And uh, if you never live, for instance, above the ground, you might say, well, that's a change. But I think people are very adaptable and there are uh, maybe uh, one third of humanity has lived above ground. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe one fourth or so. But this is not such a novelty. I live above ground for 26 years. I was born above ground, and I lived there for 26 years. And uh, and I love the ground. I'm, I really like the, the you know the outdoor nature and so on. But I don't have any qualms about the fact. I mean, I I know that I cannot get everything. I cannot make the pie, eat it, and all, all those things. I had to give up something in order to to get something else. So I'm willing to give up some of this direct contact with the ground constantly if in exchange for that I can, I can have a contacts with other things which are the institutions that man has invented and man has devel developed and so on. I'm saying this because I really think that this change m might be felt as, as very drastic, very radical for a countryman, a person born in a farm and have a, a life in a farm and so on. It might be much less than than uh, than anything really if you lived in a city you lived in an apartment house for instance and uh, you're used to that kind of relationship between between you and your uh, your home environment and the possibility the potentiality between this the home environment and the environment the public environment of the city but possibly a quality a quality change would happen which involves your ability to be really reach into those, those other institutions and by doing this become a richer person. Once you can pull things together, you can diffuse things inside. So the city should really become, or the town, should really become a playground, the whole city for children, should become a place where, uh, where for instance, the, the healthcare would be far easier because 
You don't have to go to the hospital. The hospital comes to you. Uh, nursing, learning, playing, um, interacting should become a far easier and far more diffuse kind of activity. And within this diffuse activity, you still have your island of privacy, of uh, self determination and so on, absolutely yours and uh, sacred in many ways. I believe very much in private, in privacy, I can tell you. And uh, that's why uh, the commune life, it, I can't really see it. I think we have to have the options, a daily, hourly options of being, let's say, public or being private. If th that option is absent, some kind of coercion is going to come in and at the end you're not going to be able to withstand it. And it might be good or it might be a good experience for a few hours, few days or a few weeks or a few years even to have a certain kind of life which takes away from you the privacy. But as a passing experience might be very important. As a way of life I think it's, it's pretty dismal. Yes? Could you uh, kind of elaborate on your philosophy behind the new bridge design and structure that you showed last time? They're completely different than anything that exists today. Well, I don't know if, if they are that important, really. Uh, those were about 15 years ago or 12. <clears throat> Maybe the only important thing about them is that <clears throat> I feel that when we do something fairly large in size and cost, we should, should invest, we should try to look into it and see if we cannot integrate a certain performance with other kinds of performances. And there again, it's the difference between the technological solution and the human solution. When we are after a, a, a specific answer to a specific problem, we tend to be technologically oriented. We oversimplify and we find the answer. I want to wash clothing, then I, I, I shouldn't worry about music or about uh, good food or about uh, interaction. I just have to come up with a machine that is going to wash. I mean, possibly that machine should be simpler than what we have now, but uh, we have to have a device which is strictly and uh, in a way very directly uh, involved with the action of cleaning something. But when we are dealing with something which involves more elements, which is environmentally substantial, like a bridge, uh, when, uh, when it involves uh, feelings and, uh, and uh, uh, relationship between things, then maybe we should not stick to the purely technological uh, solution answer and try to see if there is something more into it. And the more this is true, the more we have to be very careful about giving too much to technology and taking it too much away from humaneness. Uh, because we, we could ask the scientists and the technologists to, to give the answers for the environment, for instance. And the answer might be, <clears throat> might be very interesting and very, very efficient, but it might be very deadly because it doesn't it doesn't consider the, this, this aspect which goes beyond the, the performance of a specific task. The task of the environment is so complex and is so subtle and is so pervasive that unless we, we try to be open to all those things, even unconsciously, even uh, by just a, a frame of mind, we might uh, really fool ourselves into a dead uh, corner. Say the architect then should become more aware of the human considerations of what he has done before. Well, that's that's one of the dilemma of the architect. He should be a, a great scientist, a very good engineer, a technician and knows his business, and also be a very very human person. I mean, really very sensitive, extremely uh, plugged in to everything that has to do with the with the physical environment for man. And it's very rare to be able to combine those things in one person. I don't know if where teamwork can, how far it can help, because teamwork very often tends to kill the, the most subtle aspects of, of the problem, which means when we put our heads together, we come up with answers very often which, are, which make sense, again, for a, for a, a very uh, narrow 
uh, spectrum, uh, pa part of the spectrum. And then we pull those, those solutions together and we think we got the, to the total answer and very often we, we haven't. Um, where, the, where the solution is, I don't know. Uh, you know, as far as teamwork, uh, as against uh, personal decisions and so on. What we end up now by doing is we tend to give the personal decision to a, to a, um, uh, a mechanical device and uh, we tend to abdicate the responsibility of, of having a, a, a mind instead of a, of a robot making the decision. And I don't know if that's the answer, really. Yes, uh, it seems to me that uh, a large number of the problems the city got are of a sociological nature, for example, the problems of crime and racial tension and so forth. And what would be the effect of the things that you suggested be on uh, those conditions? Well, are under those conditions <coughs> uh, arising from the fact that there is a rejection or what surrounds you, because what surrounds you is it's it's not it's ugly, it's uh, sterile, and pretty soon becomes a uh, uh, littered and uh, and really uh, repellent physically and uh, metaphysically. And if we if we had to if we had to find answer, we had to keep in mind that we are psychosomatic creatures, so we are not going to find social social answers really that make sense unless the soma is being taken care of. And the soma has very much to do with what surrounds you physically. <clears throat> and what surrounds you physically is human if it serves you. It's not, not human if it doesn't serve you. It's not to do very much with size and all those things. Those are visual uh, aspects, but they are not the, the main aspects. So if we are able to define a, a good devi a device which serves you, you are beginning to make sense about your the relationship between you and your environment, because you are satisfied somatically speaking, let's say. And what seems to me it's a little overdone now is the, the, the thing that we say, well, we can be very good people even if the environment is not that good. Well, I, I doubted about that, because if I am a very tender uh, human uh, at age of two or three or even before then, and I, I'm constantly showered with information from the environment, including people, and those informations are not very, very positive, then no matter how much work the, the psychologist or the social engineer is going to be on me, I'm going to come up with a, at least a schizophrenic kind of con situation. As an animal, I am absolutely uh, resentful and uh, full of hatred and so on. And then uh, as I... Um, as a psyche, I'm told that I have to be uh, sweet and gentle and uh, open to all sorts of, you know, of nice things. Well, I don't think this is going to, we're not going to get too far with that kind of uh, segregation between the, the psychological and, and the somatic. So I think that unless we define environments which we can really respect, not out of coercion, but out of self-interest in the sense of of human interest, not, not strictly self-interest, unless we find a, a reverential uh, relationship between ourselves and our environment, we are not going to, to get rid of crime, of, uh, of uh, uh, resentment, of uh, sterility, and so on. So we have to find ways of relate ourselves to the environment in a reverential way. And how can we go about that if the environment is ugly, for instance, if, if it's re repellent, if it works against you? Uh, we, we do that by through in three ways. One is the coercion from outside. There is, a, there is the, 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 what do you call it, the, the dictator that tells you you're going to clean this room and that room because if you're not going to do it, you're not going to eat tomorrow. So that's, that's the coercive approach from outside that tells you that unless you do this, you're not going to obtain that. In this case, you can, get a, you can take care of the environment in a way. You can keep order. You can uh, keep some kind of, a, of a conditions which seems to be OK, at least superficially. The other one is self-interest. You are going to take care of this island because it belongs to you. It's, it brings you a certain income. You know that if you let it go down, the rain is going to, to lose in value. So you're going to keep up that. But between those islands, it's the no man's land, the public land. And that's 
keeps breaking down, decaying, and go, go to pieces. So uh, in both cases, you don't have something that is going to be very fruitful. The last is the reverential approach. You really believe that the environment belongs to you and to everybody else. You believe that that environment is going to do something for you and for everybody else if you really work with it and you love it and you maintain it and you develop it and so on. And that's the, the condition that we must try to achieve in order to have good man-made environments. And that then that would think, I think would take care of the bulk of the problems of social nature, of, uh, of uh, uh, justice and uh, um, law and order and etc., uh, etc. Et uh, maybe? Uh, are you suggesting that uh, you're going to have to completely <coughs> change the approach as to say, and as, a, as an example, uh, the government housing, new government housing that's being uh, done now, people are living in them. They too, a lot of the government housing is, is going back to a slum type area where they came from. Are you saying that your approach or the approach to the new city is going to have to be quite a bit different than the approach that's being used now because evidently it's not working at all? Well, I, there's no question that it has to be different. It's not that by saying this I'm saying that I know, so you should, I'll tell you what to do and uh, the solution is there. But the, the main reason why those things do not work because they, they are dormitories. You know, they are, they are taking care of a, of a fraction of the needs of a society. So housing people makes sense only if it's in, included in the housing of society, which means we cannot build uh, just uh, residential, uh, what we call residential sections of a city, forgetting that those people are not just creatures that eat and sleep and interact in their own homes, they, they need to be really plugged in with many umbilical cords to many other things which are not present there. So we cut those umbilical cords and then we tell those people they, they should behave because they, they, the government or the state or so on has helped them to find a private environment that can make sense. Well, that private environment is going to make sense when it's plugged in in society, but it's not plugged in society. Mm -hmm. By, by, building, by building housing. We have to house society, which means we have to build towns and cities. Then we can uh, really start to ask back from, from those people which are housed a respect and, uh, and this reverential uh, uh, connection with the environment. I, I think that really if, you, if you, we look at what, you know, what we do with ourselves, again, uh, for instance, uh, in, less, in, in our private life, we can see that everything we do in a new house, it can be done in an old house. In fact, many, many of us uh, go back to old houses because we find they have more to offer than the new houses. And we can do all the things we do in a new house in an old house. That works very much the same for many, many institutions, you know, uh, from the bank to the church and, and anything in the middle, in between. So I don't think that this, this doubling of knowledge has to involve a total eradication of what exists now environmentally for everything new every two or three years. I think that's really to build to uh, willfully uh, some kind of a obsolete existence and environment around ourselves, which means that we become so uncertain of what we are that we become obsolete ourselves. I think that a certain continuity in the environment is still the best thing we can, we can hope for. Uh, not just to counteract this, this great change of knowledge and technology, but uh, really because we, we, need, we need to be able to look back and to see something familiar there. And uh, the home, for instance, is one of those things. And the city should be one of those things, because if you can identify <coughs> with the city, then uh, even if the city changes very radically, you still have elements of, of identification that are going to tell you that the city is growing with you, it's changing with you, it's taking, you know, it's, uh, it's 
working with the parents instead of working against the parents and so on. So now we're saying that one environment that lasts for generations, we should really make an addition to that. Well, maybe, maybe there are more optimistic about, about uh, you know, the scale of technology to do those things. I'm not that optimistic. And the reason is also that uh, comparing, again, technology, uh, hard technology with, uh, with biotechnology, I see that though biotechnology is so, so fantastically more sophisticated, it doesn't go about things in that way. Biotechnology, it's, in a way, it's conservative. You, we, I am identical to you, and you are identical to her, and so on, practically speaking. The fact is that just through, through this identity, we, we are so able to, to be mentally free, so that in a way, we have imploded the technology, biologically speaking, and we are pretty conservative, conservative in, that, in that. And just because of those two reasons, we, we can explode our knowledge. So this, to say that to to be uh, to be adjourned and not to be conservative and not to be fossil, we had to change everything around us in uh, in this furious manner. I think it doesn't make too much sense. The mind, the the evolution of the mind, uh, has not so much to do with the change of the physical environment, as to do with how this environment is going to serve the mind. So I I'm not very keen about the archigram. I haven't seen the last two three years of work, frankly. Well, I think it's it's a good game, but I don't think it, I don't know if it has that much substance. Uh, also, because th things are not as simple as they present them, you know, they have many things, and they have a, a little connection, a thin little tube, and everything goes to that tube. Well, it's not a, it's not exactly that way. Uh, things are more massive than that, and uh, the flow and the, the logistical problems are pretty substantial, no matter how you go about it. I, I saw I saw designs with uh, a man carrying a suitcase, and I asked, "What what's that suitcase?" And the answer was, "Well, that's the car." Well, it might come the day when the car can can be put in a suitcase. We are not there yet, and maybe we won't be there for a while. And uh, so to assume that this is this is the approach that we can take to the highly complex problem of of having people working together and inter interact, I think it's pretty, you know, it's a fantasy, but it's not. And as a toy land, I think it's good. But Walt Disney is showing us very well some of those things. And uh, for instance, the, the dummies of Walt Disney are, are, are a good example of what, or in a way, the translation or, or from the biotechnology to, to, to technology. Uh, they look like people. I don't know if you saw the, all of them talk, uh, you know, the, all the, what were the, the presidents of this country grouped and uh, coming up with their own uh, little talk and then moving around and so on. And they almost look real. The fact is there is no connection between that kind of dummy, which looks like a person, and a person. A person is, a, is an incredible miracle, and the dummy is a, is, a, is a cunning technological device. So the difference there, it's very much the difference between the, the skill and the complexity of technology that we are inventing and the, and the fantastic miracle of the biotechnological thing that we are. And if we forget that, I think we are fooling ourselves. Yes? To what extent do you perceive the individual structuring physically his own environment within that technology? I, theoretically, uh, you know, you would like to say there is no limit. You can do whatever you want to. Uh, pragmatically, I don't know. Uh, first of all, you, you have to have limitations for, uh, for uh, um, reasons of, uh, of um, uh, safety, evidently. Then you have to limitations for uh, as far as encroachment on your neighbors. And then there are limitations of yourself. I don't know, I don't know if it's really right to say that because of, of we want to be a self-defining uh, people, we, we can do anything, even with our private environment. Because unless I have some kind of background on, on, on environments, I might come up with something that is going to stunt me instead of helping me. And I, we saw in, a, in small scale this happening last year. We set up the cubes, and then we said, well, now you have this cube. Do whatever you want with it. Well, most of the time, uh, what, what was done with it was so, you know, so painful. In, in every way that 
the question comes up, shouldn't, shouldn't be some kind of help for people to try to somehow to find themselves, uh, environmentally speaking, which is what, uh, what the School of Architecture should do, help people to, to define better environments for themselves. So I don't know how far you can go in saying that this is a space, instead of having a, a certain area on the ground, you have a space there, you do whatever you want with it. I would like to try it and see what happens. Uh, I tend to think now that maybe we should have some kind of a competition every, and, and so that people can present their ideas and then they would be compared and uh, maybe we could come up with some ideal within the, the choice of what we have to come up with some optimum and then see to apply those optimum and so on. There are elementary things that unless you are acquainted with, uh, you are going to mess up your life, really, physically speaking. Uh, if you don't know the few elementary principles of how to keep up, for instance, a, a surface without being too wobbly and so on, you're not going to make a table that makes too much sense. If you're not going to make a table that makes too much sense, you're going to be handicapped, at least in, in, in a small part and by the fact that you don't have a table that makes sense. And this is a fault that we, uh, I, I made tables that didn't make any sense at all. So it's not easy, and that's the reason why maybe we should try to get a certain background, background on for ourselves before we can say that the environment I'm going to design for myself is really good for me. It might not be. You know. But there should be at least options so you can put up a tent, you can plug in a trailer, you can, uh, you can ask uh, that builder to do it, you can ask that great architect to do it, who knows what. I don't have even the beginning of an answer. Uh, well, the, the, the one answer is that evidently the, the idea of government, the idea of states, the idea of nations, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, utopian idea at this point. So what is going to take the place of it? What kind of admi global administration is going to take the place of it? How far we can go with just administration of things or, uh, or coercion? or uh, imposition of rules that's, it's so open at this point. The only, the only suggestion I would have is that we are going to get somewhere seriously when we can separate authority from, uh, from um, uh, power. In other words, knowledge should be the only reason why somebody is doing what, uh, what I say maybe should be done. If this knowledge is equipped with a gun or uh, any kind of coercive, um, device, then evidently I can, I can switch from knowledge into, into uh, from authority to authoritarianism because I know that even though I might be wrong, I, you're going to do what I tell you to do because I'm going to uh, come on you and, and, and coerce you into do it. So how we can, how we are going to be able to, to distinguish between authority and, and, and power I don't know how we are going to do it, when we are going to do it, and if it's realistic, at least for a few generations. But I think that's the only point where we can really uh, have a coincidence between uh, uh, willfulness, the self-determination, and, uh, and the ability to make sense, uh, you know, or, uh, biospherically and e ecologically and so on. Yes? Can you comment briefly on the education of the architect, how you see it? Next question. <laughs> well, I think I don't it's important know. because there's some things happening today in our police and our environmental sense that yeah. mm -hmm. have some impact on, on uh, education. I wonder if you have some thoughts on that. I don't really know. If, well, you know, the feeling is that in any field, you would need a school for each person because each person has a different kind of background, genetically speaking. And not only genetically speaking, culturally speaking, if you get if you get a person that is already, let's say, 
beyond the, the elementary school. So the idea would be that uh, you have a, a, a school set up for each individual. Well, this is not possible now. Maybe, maybe when we get into more sophisticated technology, computer and so on, this becomes more feasible. But for the moment, it's still uh, a little uh, in the future. Being that not feasible, we had to come up with some kind of uh, compromises so that each person can find a little something in whatever we are setting up. And at that point, I had to shut up because I'm, I really don't, frankly, I'm not in, interested enough in what you think, if you were students, for me to, to be, really be helpful for you. The only thing I can help you is to, for you to watch what I'm doing and then try for you to make up your mind that what I'm doing has some sense so that you want to watch it longer and to, you want to participate and to learn a little more about what I'm doing. And that's the way I, I go about it. So it's the old Bottega uh, business. You have the master, which can be a painter, a sculptor, or whoever it is. And then uh, younger people that are trying to, to get something out of it. And they do their best to get it by being open-minded and uh, try to take, it, to take the positive and uh, reject the negative and so on. But evidently, that's not the whole answer. It's far from being the whole answer. Maybe we should distinguish between, uh, you know, construction and architecture. I think there's a difference. And then there's a question that architecture now, we know it makes only sense if it is integrated in, in environmental, in the environmental structure. So the architecture becomes, uh, in a way, the, the last step within this uh, staircase that, uh, mm, brings us in contact with the, with the environment so that equity is not sufficient. We have to, be, to have this congruence. Equity among ourselves, it's, it's absolutely essential. But we, it can be the equity of death because we are not able to plug in into, into the congruence of the environment. And this congruence, I think, can be achieved only if we, if we are seriously try to understand as much as we can what the, the general problem is. And the general problem has to do very much with how skillful we are in transforming matter into spirit at the end, which involves the problem of pollution. Pollution is whatever is that which impedes this process, this transformation of matter into spirit. That's really the only definition, I think, of, of global definition of pollution. And once you define it, you are, you are not very far because you, don't, you still don't know how to go about it, even if you know exactly what spirit is. But uh, we have an inkling of what uh, you know, uh, life is as against non-life. So we should try to work around it and come up with better answers. Yes. Yeah. China, there's a possibility of leaping from the pre-car age to the post-automobile mm -hmm. age. And if maybe General Motors and everything that applies is one of your existing barriers to the realization of our country. Mm -hmm. Have you considered other countries or attempted to introduce the idea? Only, only, you know, by talking or by thinking, not really by doing something about it. Well, we, we were in Ottawa with the exhibit when, uh, when the Chinese embassy became active. This was just before the Nixon stunt and so on. But uh, we had some calls, and then, and then at the end they said that they were really too busy, they couldn't come to see the exhibit, but we had a little contact there. And I don't know how far we can go anyhow. Uh, I'm, I'm very poor at social relations and all those things. So it might be that in time we, uh, we get more people involved and they will try to do something like that for the sake of the idea. Um, the other thing is that it's, as well, it's only been three years or so that we have been somehow involved with, um, with trying to get the idea across, which means after the books have been published, the, the large book, after the exhibit has, has been around a while. So we're just beginning now to get in touch with other countries and other people. Uh, Japan is, a, is almost a natural because of the, somehow the, the more tight kind of a problem they have there. So it's some, so little space with so much uh, ebullience, so much vitality and so on. 
but the, if you if you spread yourself too thin, it ends up by you're not doing doing anything. So for for me at this point, the, the most demanding thing is to keep be able to keep going with what we have, and then if something comes up, I'll be available. If you have an idea. probably in very general terms. And one reason is that the, the more you talk about intangibles, the more you make, make little sense about it. Because uh, it's, very, it's very easy, for instance, very easy if you know to write a trade treaties on, uh, on some technological device or uh, on trip to the moon and so on. But when you start to talk about what religion is and what spiritual spirituality is and what, what aesthetic is, then the only way you can get into it is to do it. You know, you, you cannot describe a poem. When you describe a poem, you just make, you describe something that you are, you're not touching really. The, the poem is the poem, and the only way to describe it is to, to write it. And the same for uh, any, kind of that, any kind of things that uh, have to do with what we call the intangible. So to say what, uh, what, I'm, what one is talking about when it, you talk about uh, spirituality or, uh, or uh, etherealization or um, moving from, uh, from the simple to the complex, or uh, or doing um, taking matter and, and uh, making it into something more subtle, it, it becomes more and more difficult the more the higher you go. But one one uh, indicate one way of explaining somehow what this spiritualization might be is really the the taking taking the universe as it is, and it's probably a fantastic <coughs> machine. Take a little pieces of it and then uh, elaborate them, work around them transform them, manipulate them into something that it reflects your own, uh, um, uh, you know, your own uh, in inners. And we do this constantly in, in every field of life. When we take whole and we transform it into steel, we evidently we are putting uh, some kind of psychic charge in, into what we are doing. So steel, steel, in a sense, it has a load of psychism or a uh, spirituality that, that the, the whore didn't have because it has been ordered in very specific ways by, by a consciousness and it's been ordered for certain purposes. So whatever we do, it's already um, a more subtle kind of, of reality than what we find <coughs> originally, or at least most of the time we do that. Sometimes we do the opposite. We, we take a, a tree, we cut it in little chunks, and when we come up with something which is far less inspiring than the tree itself. But unless we do that for a very good reason, housing uh, a spirit, and housing it not just, just uh, with purely technological terms, or, uh, functional terms, but housing it in ultra technological terms, then uh, we move from the spirit of the tree into something which is not very commendable, into the, the raw housing that we do now. That's why it's very important to, whenever we get into a process, try to see if what's at the origin is, is in a way, has more, more of this charge and what's, what's at the end or vice versa. And if this is so, then evidently we are, we are contributing to the entropic drift of existence, at least on, on this solar system. So we are working against the spirit. Everything that has an entropic shift, it's quite evidently working against life. So to be anti-entropic is to be, to, uh, be anti-pollutant. And then maybe it could be a way of trying to define what the spirit might be. To be able to um, set up some kind of intensity of, of consciousness and, uh, and of, of creativity in certain spots that are some other resultant of a certain uh, uh, manipulation of matter which had much less of it. Yes?
I wish I, I had been in Japan. I've never been there because I, I'm curious to see what Tokyo stands for and what um, Kyoto stands for, if there is a difference still. And um, I'm, I'm very, I have very, very little knowledge about, about the, the, uh, what we call the Oriental framework or reference or whatever you want to call it. And so I, I'm, very, I'm always very reluctant to try to make comparisons. And, uh, I don't know, I was asked, they, they published my work on one magazine and they asked me to make a statement and I, in the statement I, um, I tried to point out that uh, uh, it would be too bad if Japan gave up the reverence for the environment for the sake of, uh, of uh, you know, of coming up with a, with a society which is wealthy and, uh, and opulent and affluent and so on. Because I think that would be again is, would be a, a an entropic kind of of uh, revolution. But I said also that it was presumptuous for me to say that because I didn't, didn't really know the, what what the conditions were in Japan. No. Maybe one one difference that I would have with uh, with some of the Eastern uh, viewpoints is that I believe in creativity, and uh, it seems to me that. For many of those uh, ways of seeing at things, there is not so much a trust in creativity, but a trust in going back, in fusing yourself with what exists, the universe that exists. And I feel that we are not, that's not the main purpose of life. The main purpose of life is to create a new universe, which might be quite different from, from the universe that exists now. So in this sense, we are, we are creating ourselves into what you might call a, a god. We are a self-creating god. We are too funny now to be called that, but uh, you know, that's what we are trying to do, and uh, we have to respect, I think, that, and be conscious that we have this responsibility, I think, in order to come up with, uh, with next steps. You know, we have to step up. If we don't, somehow we accept the, the, the deterministic universe that we are we we are we were orig originated by and i don't think that's what we are really after that's why i make a difference between discovery invention and, and creation i think discovery is trying to somehow to understand what exists invention is to use the, this understanding to come up with te technological answers and the creation is really the, the making of a new universe the development of a new universe what the evolutionary trust is and I think there is a difference there. The thing is that each one of us is a discoverer, is an engineer, and is a creator in different, a different degrees. So we cannot separate the things. We, it's one thing, but it has those different aspects. To find out what exists is not to, to create something new. And it uh, seems to me the best example is, uh, is in the aesthetic universe. Uh, when, uh, when a composer comes up with a, a great uh, composition of sounds, he has so done something that didn't exist before. And it, it's not just a machine for something, it's an end in itself, it's, uh, it's something around which people can, can uh, <coughs> congregate and get fed by it at the mental and spiritual level, which is different from having a bulldozer that you admire and it's a great machine, it's a a very powerful instrument and you like to use it and you like to see what it does but it seems to be not an end in itself it seems to be an instrument for something else yeah, there is an exterior imposition to make the bulldozer sense to make sense out of the bulldozer the bulldozer in itself doesn't have this meaning it's a, it's only a freak of, uh, of imagination if it doesn't function in that way so it's instrumental the the piece of music is in a way final Yes. 
The archigram. Yeah, you, you use the bulldozer and the tools in creating uh, cities, and uh, the cities themselves begin to create social structures, political structures. Uh, well, help help to to create, yeah. yeah. Are, are part of the. Well, the, the in a way the difference the difference of degrees. <clears throat> because you, go, uh, you move from the simple instrument, let's say a spoon or a stick, where evidently the stick to perform doesn't, doesn't have to be a, such a metaphysical kind of thing. But at the other extreme, you have the poet composing the great poem or the, 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 the music master or so on. And, and, and so the, uh, between those, those two extremes, you have all the, the degrees of of performance and instrumentality that it's needed. So the, the bulldozer is, is some, somehow between the stick and the poem in the sense that it's still a very specialized kind of device. It, you need to move earth, so what you do, you, you come up with this, this machine. So to put more in the bulldozer than that, it's somehow extravagant. The, bulldo and the, the beauty of the bulldozer is this directness, this almost clinical ability to, to, to say formally what it does uh, functionally. So it's, it's a specific, specif specified solution for a specific problem. But it, you, when you keep moving in the direction of, of, of the mental and the human and so on, those, those things become more, you have to put more into them. The, you have to integrate more in, this, in the same phenomenon, in the same event. So that when you're talking about a house, for instance, you're talking more than a bulldozer because the, the function of the house is very complex compared to the function of the bulldozer. So you start to have to inject in the house not just purely functional answers. You have to be able to inject something more, which is much more subtle. It's, it's what makes the house a grand place to be or just, a, just an instrument for survival, even if it's an opulent kind of survival. And the city that in, includes everything, includes all those things, evidently should be more than just a, a machine for living. It should be that plus. That's why it becomes so difficult to, to come up with a the, with the good environment that makes a city. That's why it's difficult to make it into something that you have reverence for. I don't think you, you, you need that to have reverence for a bulldozer. You just want to keep it working in good shape. You like to see it working efficiently. You know that it's very useful. You know that there's a great ingenuity in making of it. But it's so confined in, in the purpose of it that it has to be accepted as such, as a good instrument for, the pur for a purpose that is outside of it. But the city becomes a something else. In a way, you are inside of it. So the, not because of it's larger than you, but because it, it influences you so much in every minute of your life that it has to be really something more than a good instrument. You seem to be uh, talking uh, a good deal about a, a spirit and a, a form of life does not exist now, which, which has not yet even been expressed. I do find it a, a difficult thing. I, I find a, a little bit of a conflict in, mm -hmm. in, in your, uh, for example, drawings and rendering of showing things that could be built today, yet of a form of uh, communication and spirit which do not exist, well, which, I, are, which are in evolution. No, but I, I think it does exist. It existed for a mini century, for instance, in uh, in Europe. I'm saying Europe because I know just a little about Europe, and I wouldn't know about Asia. But it existed uh, somehow in the framework of a, of a society that which needs, which physical needs were were far more limited than what the, the needs are now. So that unless we say that. Uh, the demands that we impose on our environment is unreasonable, and we want to get rid of, of our, the demands that we are uh, dealing with now, we have to accept, we have to put those new elements in, in the framework that we are want to define. So the city that worked very well then cannot be working well now. So that if that structure was good for that time, we have to somehow extrapolate and take that structure and move it on a new level and see <coughs> We try to come up with, a, with an answer which is as good as that answer was for that kind of condition. And you can go 
far, as far as you want to back in that, so that you don't have to limit yourself to the, to the animal man, but you can go back to the to animals. Beehives, uh, hand tips, coral reefs, and so on. And then you see that each one of those are, are pretty fantastic creatures at their, at their own level of reality. So they, they stand, again, for this spiritualization of matter into energy, but up to their own kind level of consciousness and or uh, level of spirituality and level of intensity of life. So what, what was intense there and very fitting and uh, very beautiful cannot be sufficient for, for us. So we have to really transfigure that kind of condition into, into the human condition. That means inject more intensity of life. And, and though we, don't know, we cannot pinpoint, we know very well what we talk about. No, no one of us would like to be an ant or a bee, evidently. But you can say that no bee would like to be a man, but the question is that the bee doesn't, doesn't know what, we know a little more what the bee is than the bee knows what the man is, for the simple reasons of evolution. Uh, but uh, there's, there's more than an analogy, I think. There is just the, this continuity which stands for, for how life is able to implement itself in more lively and more etherealized and more uh, sophisticated and more uh, spiritual expression. So this manipulation of pure, what we might call pure matter into pure spirit, it's not, some, it's not a fantasy. I mean, it's, you can measure it. You, we are living it, really. Uh oh. <laughs> Can I ask uh -oh. a question about uh, speak, you speak a good deal about spirit and, uh, and uh, desire. Mm. And I, uh, not to make uh, too close an analogy, but uh, uh, Lewis Kahn speaks a good deal about this. And some of the things he's built, he claims to have this spirit there. You know, uh, do you find that? Uh, as an analogy in an ecological way or in a way that uh, of expression? Well, I remember <coughs> when, the, when the salt uh, labs were just finished. We just happened to be there, so we, we, we drove through the, the big campus, which is, I don't know, it's nearby, you know, big uh, pretentious things, and well, it looked like ponderous, but uh, it had something, maybe. And then we drove to, we, we stopped at the, at the va salt vaccine. And uh, you could find a difference between, you know, matter and spirit right there. No, and we didn't know about the, how well it would work, uh, how, how uh, fitting was for the purpose and so on. But just, just what you saw told you that there was a great spirit there certainly greater than the spirit that was in the campus. And it doesn't take very much to, to feel that. I think anybody can feel it. So there's, there is something to it, uh, to the, this fact that comes a moment when uh, there is so much power in, in a certain phenomenon that this phenomenon is going to set up its own functions, which is forms comes before function. That, that, that might not have been the case for him because he might have had a very good program he might come up with the right answer for the program. The fact is there was much more to it than that. There was the spirit of Louis Kahn, a very, a very intense spirit, I think. Um, and I don't know if it, how they are working, the, those uh, uh, labs. I'm not sure either. Uh, another project is in Dr. Pakistan, where he spoke once about politics uh, and, and how he relates to politics today. And he doesn't, he's not overly concerned with the circumstances of politics, but he claims that in a way, uh, and that might be manifest in that, the beginning mm -hmm. of the capital, uh, and now with the change of political scene in, in that country, mm -hmm. uh, that maybe that architecture can live through that. Uh, so mm -hmm. In other words, the spirit of the, the idea 
idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's working that way, but, but he, uh, he doesn't seem to be very concerned about the, the things that mm -hmm. change every day, but more about spirit. I'm mean, just trying to relate that. Yeah. To well, I, I would still have uh, reservations in the sense that, that my, uh, a beautiful building and it, the more the better if it performs well, evidently, uh, because architecture is, is not just a beautiful building, evidently. Mm, I still have much more than that. But it's still, it's, still a, uh, it's still something that doesn't go at the heart of the problem, which is not the building, but the environment. So one, one of my qualms about, uh, about architects is that, for some reason, they are not enough concern about you know, the total environment. And so to design beautiful buildings, it's still, uh, in a sense, is beside the point at this point, because we are really dealing with the problems which are far more uh, involved with, uh, with survival and something more than survival. And I don't know how much Louis Kahn is doing about that. Well, evidently, sooner or later, it implies a change of, uh, of priorities. And it might be a very drastic change because it implies that we are really uh, trusting less on uh, ownership, uh, security, comfort, and somehow trusting more in, uh, again, <laughs> in vitality. And the two things do not, do not seem to coincide. In fact, it seems that once you get into a stage which is what you might call the opulent stage, things start to break down because the will for, of life seems to be draining out for some peculiar reason. So that I, I think that if the frame of reference that we have now is maintained, it's quite possible that this country is going to set itself aside from, from the, real, the real flow of reality. And that's why I, I tend to feel that the practical man of this country, and this was the great, the great pride of this country, to be very practical, is finding itself more and more uh, ignored by the, by the problematics of life, survival and super survival, trans survival, something that has great things to do on, on the metaphysical level. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm totally ignorant about economic uh, structures and the relationship between the economy and politics and so on. But I really feel that uh, people that are, that are involved with, with those things and they know more about those things, they should, should also take a look at the, at the contest which is more realistic than what they think. And it's the contest really of seriously trying to set man in, in, uh, within a setting which belongs to man, which is the, the well, maybe the noon sphere of, of Chardin. And this very simple fact that uh, originally this, this planet was pure rock and fire. And if, if a, a, a mineral god made decisions, then that mineral god wasn't making the decision that we are going to make now, which means that every, every age has to have its own uh, uh, pragmatism. And the pragmatism of this, of this country, at this age, I think it's, it's uh, past. It's really not any more relevant. It's relevant in the sense that we are going to carry on with that kind of pragmatism for a while, but it's not going to help us very much to, to move from, uh, from the condition of, 
stone into the condition of spirit, which is really the only reality that makes sense uh, in the long run. So the fact that we might, we might be on a ledge now and we don't want to move from that ledge doesn't mean that the mountain is there and has to be climbed sooner or later. And to climb that mountain, probably the, the framework of reference and the framework of action that we have now is not going to make so much sense. It might take one generation or half generation or three or four generations to realize mm -hmm. that, but it's going to come. Mm -hmm. in, in that sense, I think that, for instance, this idea of territoriality and ownership, it's very important now. It might be utterly ridiculous a uh, few generations from now. I think the only territoriality which really fundamental is the territoriality of the mind, which means knowledge is what I possess. Knowledge is mine in the sense that it makes me tuned in with what surrounds me and makes tuned tune in with what you are and so on. And beside this, there is very little else that makes, makes sense as far as owning. I own what I know. And beside that, everything else is very precarious. So that, in a way, if that's true, then, uh, then this business of no, that we are so much involved with now, it's, it's pretty relevant. Uh, it's again, it's an instrument that might have helped us to move from a certain position to an next position, but it might be time now to drop the instrument and look at man. Do, drop the instrument, not, not to go back to the Garden of Eden, which is uh, a pretty f fantasy, but to, to move to the next step, into the next step of uh, including a, a more sophisticated technology, a more uh, technology looking more forward than backwards and so on, which is a nice talk, but doesn't, you have to come up with the hardware always. Well, if I had to put in a few words, I would say a reverential uh, attitude toward, toward life. Really, if we, cannot, if we cannot get into that frame, it, it doesn't matter very much what we are going to do. If, if we are cynical and uh, 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 furious and, uh, and um, disposed in an ugly way about what we are and what surrounds us, including other people, then uh, the skill and the cunning that we are putting in, in doing things, it doesn't make very much sense. I mean, it, it's not going to do very much for us. So to, to have, a, to have a, a reverential consciousness of what, what life might be, even if we don't know what it is, and life includes the, includes the rock and the creature and the tree and the leaf and the flower and so on, and the person and the animal, and what we do, what we do with our environment, if this is not, if we cannot get to that kind of, of uh, platform, which is not a platform, is, a, is an environmental, it's an existential feeling, uh, then uh, we are not, you know, then, then uh, materialism is very reasonable. And to buffer yourself from danger and from any, any sorts of shocks and any sorts of, uh, of unknown things, it's the only way to survive. It's a pretty uh, gray and sterile kind of picture. And risk is part of, uh, of liveliness. If we're not willing to take chances, we're not, we're not moving.